if you can see, we've had some trouble with the screen acting up this morning. I don't think it likes the rain or something. Let me understand. <laughs> 296, you might want to get a book just to be prepared. All right. Let's sing. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. appreciate very much your presence if you are joining us in the building or if you are out in your car this morning we appreciate very much you making the effort to be here it's an encouragement to us for you to do that if you're missing brother russ this morning he uh he called andrew i think last night about uh, 10 o'clock he texted me this morning and said that he had spoken to him he is dealing with I'm sure, not sure exactly what it is, an abscess tooth or something that's causing his jaw to swell really bad. He's not able to talk or anything like that. So he's hoping to see a doctor the first of the week and, and get that taken care of. So remember him in your prayers if you would. Uh, but Andrew graciously has uh, volunteered to fill in for him. So we're looking forward to, to that this morning. We appreciate what he's done in the Bible class already this morning. We want to remind you that we do will have a, a trunk or treat coming up on Wednesday, October the 27th. Uh, so remember that. That will be following our Wednesday evening Bible study. We want to do a, uh, a soup and cornbread meal before we have our service that night. So remember that. Service time normally at 6.30. So we'll probably be here an hour or so before that to, uh, to enjoy uh, some soup and then have our trunk or treat following our service. So remember that. Also, I want to remember all of those that we have on our prayer list, uh, those that we know about. If we need to make any updates or anything, please let us know. Uh, we want to remember, uh, mention again, Carolyn Croft. This is a friend of Louise's mom uh, that's in, in bad need of your prayers at this time. So remember those and remember any that we may not know about. If there's any unspoken requests or anything out there, we want to remember all of our members as we've mentioned many times before. Our next song will be number 47, the title, Holy, 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 47. <clears throat> we'll sing verses 1 and 4 of this song. Right, let's sing. Holy, 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 Lord. Holy, holy. 
827, 827, sweet hour of prayer. <clears throat> we'll sing verses 1 and 3 of this song. 827. Let's sing. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from Isaiah chapter 43 verse 10 you are my witness says the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me there was no God formed nor shall there be after me let us pray dear God we thank you for this day that you have given us and we thank you for many blessings we thank you for this and other opportunity to come here and worship you and we pray as we go through all the elements of our service that we're clear of minds of worldly thoughts and we're focused on you. We pray for this congregation that meets here in Rainsville. We pray for all the members here. And we pray for all the works we're involved in. But we also pray that the works we're involved in, the ultimate goal will be bringing losses unto you. We pray for those that was that's sick that's on the announcement sheet this morning. We pray if it be your will, they can gain their health and take their regular steps in life. And we pray, even though it is not worthy of it, that you sent your Son on this earth to die on a cross for our sins, that we may have hope of heaven. And we pray as we go out in the world on a day-to-day -day basis that we conduct ourselves, that people can see you working in us. We also pray that we live our life on this earth, that a home in heaven will be ours. And these things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. As we prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 315. 315, when I survey the wondrous cross. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of this song. Let's sing. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the of glory died. My riches gain I count but lost and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should 
service to God is important, every single part of it. And to single out one part being more important than the other is probably not the right thing to do. What we're about to do, though, is partake of the Lord's Supper. We do this in remembrance of our Lord and Savior. It's pretty important. Matter of fact, it's really important. So let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you so very much for this opportunity, the true opportunity that it is to come around your table, to partake of this bread, which to us as Christians represents your son's body as it hung on the cross between heaven and earth. We do this freely, Father, and we do this because we want to remember your son as commanded, but we want to remember him, and we thank you for him. In his name we pray, Jesus the Christ, amen. to us as Christians represents your son's shed blood on the cross for the remission of our sins, the only blood that can, can do that. And we thank you, Father, for his sacrifice, your willingness to send him, and his willingness to come here. For we pray in his name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. the Lord's Supper. And as a reminder, which I guess we, we all need it, I was going to say, you can, you're so very good at supplying the, the needs of the church. But we are blessed. We are definitely blessed. Um, there are places in this country that are not getting any rain. They have no water. We have water. We have rain. It may be a hindrance to us, but if you've been in the agricultural business, like several of you are and myself was, you'll know how important the rain is. We eat because it rains. Being so, saying that all is how blessed that we truly are. And so when we attempt to give back to God, we give back with a cheerful heart. We give back knowing that he gives us far more than we ever receive. So let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come back and, and give a portion of what you have so richly blessed us with. We thank you, Father, for all our homes, or this country, their jobs, or everything that we have. And we pray, Father, that as we give back, that you'll do great things with these funds. This we pray in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our next song will be number 300, number 300. Praise Him, praise Him. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. Let's sing. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O Tell of his excellent greatness. 
this morning. In the religious culture today, the word witness has been used to refer to, at times, what we may call evangelism. And the reaction many get is somewhat negative toward this idea of witness. It was largely labeled a denominational term, much like other terms. Anything that is labeled that, we often want to want run away from. Another example of that would be the word pastor, and just because some people may misuse that doesn't mean that we shouldn't use that scripturally in an accurate way. But there is a negative connotation by many, and here's an article I just want to read to you to help maybe explain that. And to some of you that may be completely foreign, the person wrote in this article, when a member of a denomination stands up and witnesses, they usually tell all the great things God has done for them in their life. Perhaps they will speak about how God saved them from drugs. Perhaps they may speak about how God helped them with a financial crisis. Perhaps they tell about how God helped them become a good father or mother. But witnessing is always how God personally helped you and I. The focus of these testimonies is upon the individual's personal 
experience. Those that stand up and give personal testimonies and witness for God are doing the world no favor. They are not preaching the Word of God, but are preaching their own subjective emotional experiences. They're causing people to believe something other than the Word of God. And it is not biblical faith. Why would Christians get caught up in such foolishness? They no longer believe faith comes by hearing the Word of God. They believe God's power lies within their own personal experience rather than the resurrection of the Son of God. Let us put away such speech. Now again, that's an article. And this illustrates the word that I believe witnessing is a part of our Christian life. And this morning I want us to see what witnessing is and what the Bible says about being a witness. Witnessing means to testify or to bear witness. And there are really two main usages of the word witness. One is today a religious connotation and the other is a legal proceeding. A witness stand, if you will. The word for us is not super common. And yet, one of the interesting things is that this word in the Hebrew and the Greek appears about 400 times total. It's a very common scripture word, by the way. Witness is mentioned more times than baptism in scripture. It is a fairly common word. And it both forms of nouns and verbs. In the noun format, it's being a witness. But in verb form, you'll hear it this way, bearing witness, or bearing false witness, if you will. There are three things you can bear witness. The first thing is people. People can be a witness. An example of that is in Ruth chapter 4. Boaz has been sent to the closest kinsman of Naomi in order to redeem Ruth, but the way Naomi puts it is, we'll go redeem the land. And of course the kinsman says, yeah, I'll redeem their land. And Boaz says, understand and Ruth comes with the land. And at that point, the kinsman says, I don't want to add any more hairs to my estate that's there. And so he agrees to forego this redemption, which allows Boaz to come in and redeem Ruth. What is interesting, though, is what he does there in verse 9. Boaz has gathered all the elders and people, and they serve here in Ruth chapter 4, verse 9, as witnesses. At the agreement that Boaz can take this person's spot, he says in verse 9, And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilean's and Mahalon's and from the hand of Naomi. He's doing this, so if there is a dispute later, these physical witnesses can be brought forward and they witness the agreement or covenant. And there are witnesses. Next, we see as a witness is God. And we see this multiple times in Scripture. Back in Genesis chapter 31, Jacob has snuck out of Laban's house or his property, and he's running away from Laban. And you remember that story where Laban tracks them down because she has stolen the idol from his house. They have this interaction, and Laban wants him to come back, and Jacob says no, and so they make a covenant. And look in Genesis chapter 31 and verse 44. Now therefore come, let us make a covenant to you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. And so Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there on the heap. Laban called it Jagar. Sayadutha, but Jacob called it Galeed. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore its name was called Galeed, also Mizpah, because he said, May the Lord watch between you and me, and we are absent from one another. If you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Here God is the witness of the covenant between Jacob and Laban. In John chapter 8, we see something similar. Jesus is being questioned, and Jesus testifies about who he is. And the Pharisees say back to him, as we would, wait a minute, you can't serve as a witness by yourself. It doesn't work that way. And Jesus answers them in verse 14, in John chapter 8 and verse 14, the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. 
but you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one, and yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. And so Jesus goes to the Pharisees and says, wait a minute, it takes two witnesses to bear something true. I bear witness about who I am, and my Father does. And they ask, where is your Father? And that's when they get mad because he says his Father is God. Paul even uses this idea of God being a witness. In Romans chapter 1, verse 8, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. He uses it in Philippians chapter 1, verse 8, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. I want to show us this idea of God being a witness because I got to tell you, I hear that. And when you hear somebody say today, God is my witness, that really throws us off. We take that negatively because in reality, if you're using God as witness to emphasize that you're telling the truth, we see Jesus saying, yea be yea and your nays be nay, and you can't swear an oath, and we would include that in that category. And yet, what is interesting is you have Jesus and Paul both doing that, and others saying, God is my witness. So God can serve as a witness. And finally, an object can serve as a witness. In Genesis chapter 31, we saw this heap of stones. In Joshua 24, we see the same thing. Remember, Joshua 24 and verse 15 says, Choose who you will serve. And they come back and say, We will serve God. But the end of that chapter, and in verse 26, Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that, that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness for us. For it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. Joshua says, This stone is a witness. And it's the idea of almost a memorial. But this stone has probably a date or something written in it, that covenant. But every time they passed that stone, it was a witness that would remind them of the covenant they made with God. And so you have people being a witness. You have God being a witness. And you have objects being a witness of Scripture. And while all that is interesting, that just helps us understand the Word. But I want us, what I want us to do now, now is, I want us to think about this Word in Scripture. And I want us to think about this Word as a story of the Bible, using this idea of being a witness. And as we begin there, I want us to imply, simply understand the idea of being a witness. And that is the idea of represent, representing something. You would not think of representing being a synonym, and yet it is. Think about that stone. An object was a witness. Why? It represented a covenant at that location. By the way, it's not odd for an object to be a witness, okay? You probably wear one on your left hand. A ring serves as a witness that you were married. It testifies to anybody who sees your finger that you were married. And when you think about your wedding ring as being a witness of your marriage covenant, it's also a representation of your marriage covenant. With that in mind, i got to tell you, I see this idea mentioned, not in name, but the concept begins in Genesis chapter 1 that God has intended for mankind to be a witness for Him. We were created with this in mind. In Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, 27, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. God created us in his image. What does that mean? Man was created to represent God on earth. 
Well, you've talked about it before, about the idea of being priests and kings for God. We were created to be priests and kings. And the idea of being priests is representing the glory of God to all the gods of creation. In that sense, it's the same idea of the word witness. When people see us and listen to what I'm saying here, when people see us, our life, our form, our behavior, our entire being is intended to serve as a witness of who God is, as a representation of that. And as you follow in the biblical story, what you see next is that God shows them one specific group of people to be His witnesses. It's Israel. And in Genesis chapter 12, He's going to give them those three promises. One, the land. Two, make them a nation. And three, through their seed, all the families would be blessed. God chooses Abraham's family to show all the families of the earth the blessing of God to be a witness to all of the families of the earth. And in Exodus chapter 19, it is extremely made clear with Moses. It says in verse 3, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. As part of the covenant, Moses goes down to Mount Sinai. Moses tells them we have a specific special role as priests and kings to all nations, a loyal priesthood. And when we think about royal priesthood, we jump all the way to 1 Peter, right? But we see the idea throughout Scripture, which is why a few weeks ago I chose to do those lessons on the Old Testament and how they still apply to us today. They were to be a priesthood to the nations. And while the term witness is not there, the next passage we'll look at makes that even more clear. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 8, Bring out all the blind people who have eyes, and the deaf who have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled, who among them can declare this and show us former things. Let them bring out their witnesses, that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say, It is truth, you are my witnesses, says the Lord. And my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you, therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Israel, God says to them, you are my witnesses. To who? To all the nation around you. You are witnesses. I have sent to declare me to them. And what is interesting about Isaiah is that already in chapter 42, he has already called Israel deaf and blind. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 18, Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send, who is blind as he who is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant. God is saying He has chose Israel to be the witnesses, but they turn out to be deaf, blind witnesses. Now just look at the irony of that, the way that is put together. When you have a witness in a legal proceeding, you would have to think that somebody who cannot see and cannot hear could possibly be the worst witness to a crime. And God tells Isaiah, you are deaf and blind witnesses. And then he comes in in chapter 43 and says, you are supposed to be my witness. In chapter 49, God says he will send a servant that opens their eyes and ears as a lot. And in John chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. Jesus is a witness. In Luke chapter 4, he quotes from Isaiah chapter 61, And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. 
And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set all liberty, those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus says, I am the servant who comes to proclaim or testify or bear witness, if you will. He is the chief witness. Revelation chapter 1 describes him as the chief witness, by the way, to open the eyes and ears of God's people. His role ultimately leads him to his death. In Luke chapter 22, in verse 66, says, As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And and they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. It was his testimony as a witness that put him on the cross. He was God's son. It is interesting that in Scripture the disciples are referred to as witnesses. Before we get into this, this is where people attack the word witness because in this time period there are people who are eyewitnesses to Jesus' death. And there's a lot being the fact you can't be a witness because you weren't there. But I want you to notice the way Scripture uses the term witness. In Acts chapter 1, 6 through 8, Therefore when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all in Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. One thing to keep in mind is that witnesses there are not just the twelve apostles. Secondly, I want you to see the similarities of what Jesus says. He says essentially the same thing Isaiah instructed the people in Isaiah 43. You are my witnesses to all of the earth. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 32, this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. And that's the eyewitness testimony. In verse 40, and with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. But then we go to Acts 13. And here's what's interesting here. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 13:50 through 52 and go into Acts 14, verses 1 and 3. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews, and so spoke with a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the children, against the brethren. Therefore they stayed up there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Here Paul Paul and Barnabas are now bearing witness. One of the challenges is here, can we ever see Barnabas being an eyewitness to Jesus? If you can't be a witness without essentially being one of the twelve, then how can Barnabas be called a witness? Or how about Stephen in Acts chapter 22 and verse 20? Stephen being called a witness. Stephen, friends, listen to me. There is nowhere to see where Stephen was a witness to Christ. How can Stephen be a witness if he doesn't measure up to the standards that we have? Or how about when Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. Knowing that Timothy wasn't around, and yet he has a testimony to not be ashamed of. Who testifies? Who gives a testimony? 
What you see is early Christians were referred to as, a wit as witnesses who gave a testimony, who bore witness to the grace of God, and were told their life serves as a witness. That's what John says in chapter 5, verse 36. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. In John chapter 10, verse 25, Jesus says, My works are witnesses about me. He says the same idea here. I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. The works about who Jesus is. But what about my works? In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves who will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit, you will know them. Your works and your life testifies about who you are. They serve to be a witness of you. Your life is a witness. Let me wrap all this up and tell you what this means for us today. It has always been God's intent for mankind, who, who was made in His image, to serve as witnesses of God to the world. It is the idea of this priesthood, and we know this from history, man has consistently failed at this. Israel was told to be a witness, and he says they were deaf and they were blind. They couldn't testify about God because they weren't listening. They weren't seeing Him. They couldn't be a living testimony for Him. They could not be a royal priesthood. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness in His marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. You and I have the same exact role as Israel. The exact same role intended from the beginning of time. To be a holy nation that people look at and they see something different that can only be contributed to a powerful, living God. Your life is supposed to testify, not of yourself, but of God. You are a living testimony. How do you do that? Peter tells us to conduct yourself as to be honorable. You want people to see that your life has changed because you follow Christ. You know why Israel was deaf and blind? And why they failed to be the witness God needed? Because from the very beginning moment we see them cross the Jordan, what we see is this very strong desire from them. Rather than being different from the nations, they wanted to be like everyone else. And rather than sticking out and declaring the goodness and the glory of God, they wanted to blend in like everybody else. That's me. That's who I am. I don't want to be different from everybody. I don't want to be weird. I don't want to be the sore thumb. I want to be like everybody. I want to be cool or lit, as the teenagers say. But my life is supposed to be different. Read through Acts and see the witnesses, these people that were different. Do you realize in the first century it didn't take a sign to realize who the Christians were? Their life testified who they were. Here's what I want you to understand. This idea of witnessing is not a conversation you practice for somebody. Giving your testimony isn't a speech. It's not a speech to your friend who you want to become a Christian. Being a witness is living a changed life. This is a representation that not only am I an image of God, but I'm conforming to that image and walking in the light and putting my trust in Him. And that is supposed to be something that people see more than they hear. I tell you this, if you don't live your life as a witness for God and your friend sees that, your pre-planned speech won't matter. 
Be a witness, not just when we hear the gospel. Every single day be different. And when we realize that we are supposed to be a representation of God, time does not permit to go into what all of that looks like. The fruit of the Spirit, love, forgiveness. When I understand that, I don't have to have a program for evangelism. When I allow myself to be changed, everyone is going to see that. We want them to experience what we experience. We are supposed to be happy. People are supposed to see that in us. Are we deaf by witnesses? Why do we still act like we're the lost? Jesus says to go out and baptize all nations. But how can we do that if we can't conform ourselves to the likeness of Christ? You are my witnesses, he says. As you leave here, this is our identity. It is who we are, representatives of God. Be a witness. This morning you must hear the word of God. You must believe it and be repentful. Confess that he is the son of God and be baptized for the mission of sins. If you want to do that this morning... I'd be glad to do that. As well, if you want to ask for forgiveness from the congregation, you may do that as well as we stand and as we sing. so much for being here and be back this evening at six o'clock.
Father, we ask that you be with us as we go to our destinations. Help us to enjoy the rest of your day. Father, we ask that you forgive us of our sins when our life is over here on this earth. We ask for a home in heaven. These favors and blessings we ask in thy son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen.